with you, uh, NPR. Like, what are you thinking? How are you feeling from your seat in the world? Um, what's up with NFTs? Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen it in past cycles, like the attention shifts. And at least for me, like, I'm ba- I've been big in these meme coins. Like, I love them. I think it's fun. But I have a feeling that there's a lot of people we think we're taking offers on NFTs to go chase meme coins. And that attention just rotates back into NFTs at some point. Like, I know that I moved from DeFi to NFTs because, I mean, last cycle, because it was just so... You have to stare at these meme coin charts all day. It's like, it's such a tiring endeavor that eventually, like, I was like, oh, these NFT floors don't move that fast. Like, you can kind of buy them and it's less (laughs) intensive. And so I think that, like, yeah, these meme coins are going to keep running, but there's a lot of these projects that people still really like. And at some point, like, there will be a bottom and the attention will shift back, in my opinion. Well, it feels like the communities in the in the NFT side, it's just such a stronger like, base of community. Like, I can't remember that kid that had his, like, crypto punk, but he was kind of like, you know, I'm not going to sell this thing. He didn't have any money, but he was like, I'm not going to sell this thing for $10 million because without it, who am I? Right? Like, you don't you don't get that, you know, with, like, some of the meme coin community of saying, like, hey, I'm not going to sell this little bit of Doge because without it, who am I? Like, I feel like there's a huge difference there between, you know, just that community side of what's going on. Well, yeah, like, it's really hard to get emotionally attached to meme coins. Like, it's, I mean, I have, like, Litecoin that I bought, like, a decade ago that I'm, like, really emotionally attached to and I've never sold. But otherwise, like, coins are just numbers, and number, it's fun to see the number go up and down and that whole game, but, like, there are certain NFTs that, like, I feel very attached to, where I'm, like, I can't even fathom selling these. And then also, like, if you think about it, especially with, like, seals or, like, some of the ones I'm more, you know, bullish on, I get more value out of that community than I, I could possibly get out of them. They're telling me about meme coins. Like, they're telling me about these things that are... Like, uh, WAP got us all on Bitcoin ordinals. Like, I don't know if you remember, but uh, Sappy Seals were, I think, the first ETH NFT to inscribe ordinals. So we had that and had, like, a whole kind of lecture on that from WAP and how we should get into that. And then from there, like, it's not even... He, he was the one who kind of was pushing us, like, guys... Go look at these coins. Go look at all this. I mean, I got pups at like six cents because all the sappy seals were like, hey, this is like the next one. And like, I don't even question when somebody like, shout out like Lord Arf and like Yala. There's some people in our community who like really know what's going on. And if I didn't have this NFT, I wouldn't have gotten that alpha. So it's like, yeah, I can see how people would be like, oh, well, this, you know, ETH NFTs are dead. Like, yeah, I hear you, but people are saying meme coins were dead, like, a year ago. You know what I mean? Like, Pepe kind of had that first people run-up. People were saying Bitcoin was dead when FTX happened. <laughs> like, oh, my God. I, I, do, I, do wish, I do wish, though, that Charlie Lee was as attached to his Litecoin as you are. I will say that. Um, <laughs> Nikki, what's up? <laughs> what's up guys yeah good points being made and i think uh npr you just made the the ultimate point which is like nfts really should have been used as an access pass to a valuable community beyond anything else the utility aspect was a grift for the most part um and we're starting to see some some real utility like the ip being leveraged into um you know, toys like with, with Luka Zoo and with uh, Pudgy Penguins, or now you might see Azuki's in this anime um, ecosystem or whatever. But those are second and third order effects that take potentially years to play out. Um, and not every not every project is going to have the capability of achieving anything like that. If, if you back up into what it initially was, which is, again, access to a community, and that community can provide value, 
then great. That's all it really needs to be. And sort of the, the floor price of the asset should be a beta to how valuable that community is. You see it with something like, um, with what like uh, Mambo's doing on, on Solana with uh, the 6.9. Those NFTs are going for like 40 grand, but I hear that the alpha that's being shared in there is, is well worth the, the cost of entry. Um, but I think also there's there's an element to NFTs where, you know, meme coins offer a lot of the same dynamics as NFTs. They're fun, they're funny, they're accessible, um, they're easy to like rotate in and out of, but they're easier. They offer more liquidity because of the, you know, the AMM dynamics on the, on the open market. Um, and liquidity dynamics don't really work for NFTs. We saw that with Blur, right? Everybody says Blur killed NFTs. It's not true. Lack of demand is what's hurting the NFTs. Blur is only accelerating and exacerbating that issue. Um, they are luxury assets. At the end of the day, it's like any collectible. It's like any art piece. Um, the patrons of art are people who are buying things because they like them for the most part. They're not necessarily expecting a return immediately, and they can afford to do so. In a, in a market like this, where there's a ton of attention being put on a bunch of different things and huge rotations of capital going through a uh, variety of verticals, you're going you're gonna to see uh, collectibles suffer, at least in the short term. That I agree with NPR though. That does rotate back. Yeah, I think I think you're right. And like the the utility side of it, actually, it's always kind of confused me a little bit, to be honest. Like as someone that you know has built and has a software company with Lunar Crush, like I think just because we're on like the internet, people think that you know because uh, you have a, a you know an NFT community that's on the internet that like it should be building some sort of like software utility or like an app, right? And I think people kind of forget that like. You know, you can be a member of a golf club and just have like the social club membership and people pay a shit ton of money every year to be a part of a social club to go do what? Literally just hang out with other people. That is literally the entire point. It's like a local spot. And like we are all living on the Internet. And, you know, if you're living in a rural area, you're living somewhere else, but you're not around people. Maybe you work at a desk job all day and you're like, I just want to hang out with people. And my barrier to entry is this thing. Why do suddenly we need to now build like a DAP to like justify what we're doing? It just never made sense to me. Fatty Bags, go ahead. Thanks, Joe. I appreciate it, man. Uh, you, you really hit a note there with rural. I live like three hours out into the woods. It's a two and a half hour drive to get groceries one way. Um, you know, being part of Web3 has really helped connect me to so many people in this space. I mean, this was all by design. Obviously, I created the self-suffering, but also enjoyment. Um, I wanted to tap into a, a couple things here uh, as far as what's going on with the market. I mean, one thing that I like to rem remind people of is that the market is cyclic. Like, all of this, uh, it's going to come and go. There's going to be massive liquidity rotations. Um, and those on the timeline who are screaming NFTs are dead, uh, quite frankly, they just haven't been here long enough, and I truly believe that. Um, art itself is a wonderful store of value uh, and identity for a lot of people, um, and to think that it wouldn't rotate back to that ultimately or at some point would be extremely foolish. Um, the space itself is heavily ADD, and it suffers from shiny object syndrome, so we, we all know that. Uh, meme coins are a prime example of that, although very fun. Uh, the longevity of that entire movement is rather short, um, but I love to see it because it's keeping people excited. It's keeping people happy. It's, I mean, it's the casino, really. It really is. We're all pulling the, the lever, hoping that we hit the next 100x, and that's fun. It's healthy uh, in a lot of ways, but it can also be dangerous uh, to new people, uh, younger Gen Zers and shit who see this on TikTok potentially and go, oh, you know, meme coins? I can make all this money doing very little uh, they get wrecked, and then it's like, oh, damn, maybe crypto is a scam. So something to be, uh, you know, very aware of. Um, again, another thing I wanted to touch on real quick, and then I'll pass this off, is, you know, art is a vessel for mass adoption and onboarding. So when people are talking about NFTs being dead, again, uh, a very silly sentiment. Uh, if you look at it as a true onboarding tool, uh, people are able to look at it as a tangible asset and go, hey, this is something that I can hold on to forever, even if it goes to fucking zero. And I love the artist. Excuse my French. If it goes to zero, I love the artist. Uh, at least I have this piece of art that this person created. I identify with that. I hold on to it. Uh, and this thing holds value to me, even if it does go to zero. So, you know, you are onboarding in that way. And then ultimately, the last thing I wanted to touch on is, you know, fine art, I think, will be the staple long term. So small supply, high demand artists, 
that are putting out really niche, nice stuff. I think ultimately that sector, that corner of the market will always uh, maintain value, will always maintain interest, just like the real art world uh, with traditional art and traditional artists that we all love so much. So appreciate you guys having me up here. Yeah, good points. And yeah, huge, huge bags for like small niche kind of traditional artists too, that people just don't see that market and they just see it more because we're on the internet. Uh, we'll go to Zed's and then we'll go to David. And David only likes 10Xs, not 100Xs. Zed's, go ahead. I appreciate it. And uh, some really good points there from, from Fatty Bags. Um, my take on it is is simply, you know, I think, again, it comes back to the, the cycle we're in. But meme coins work because they're, they're simple. You know, there's no bullshit utility, no promises attached. You know, they don't need to sell you on, on what they are because they're, they're universally understood. You know, whether it's a, a picture of a dog or whatever, you know, you buy it because you think it's funny. You see the community rallying around on, on X or, or again, like someone just mentioned, then you think it's your next uh, lottery ticket. Now, NFTs are, are naturally a, a quite a lot more complex, but I think that the sentiment remains the same. Like you don't need to introduce complexities, uh, complexities for the sake of feeling you're adding more value. Um and also, like, look at the the, the way the, the community rivals in, in the, all the sentiment in, in meme coins. You know, it's straightforward. You work for your bags, stay active in charts, you share over the timeline, you share to your friends. In essence, you, you become part of, of the team. And, and I think that's what NFTs used to be. Um, I think that, you know, ultimately, we just need to... I, I think, like, meme coins will... You know, the, we've never seen a, a cycle like this where they've stayed relevant for so long. But again... They're just because it's a very speculative asset, uh, and that's what NFTs are not right now. So I think uh, NFTs will, will certainly come back. I don't think they're dead by by any means. Um, I think that you know when so many people are flexing these you know uh, screenshots on on Twitter that they're, they're making X you know ten X hundred X off these moon coins. You know everyone's then trying to find the next play, but the reality is that you know they're far and few between. Not everyone's making that money. Uh, and it's a lot easier to, to lose a lot of money off, off meme coins than NFTs. But yeah, I, I truly believe that, that we'll see the value coming back into uh, and liquidity coming back into NFT soon. Great take. David. Oh, man. All, all of these speakers up here made some excellent points. Put it very eloquently. I'm going to use some smaller words in uh, my points that I'm going to get across. First off, Joe, I would not mind 100x, but... I, I would settle for a 10. I mean, that's that's just me. But, you know, NFTs, like the communities and just the the camaraderie in this side of the in this part of the space, you, you don't get that with meme coins. You don't even get that with the with the gaming communities, like building in public with the games and seeing what they do is one of the you know, that's one of the utilities that those companies point to. With NFTs and like, you know, you sappy seals, pudgy penguins, those that to me like, they're building in the open of all of Web3. We get a front row seat to what's going on because the founders of those communities have a ve have their finger to the pulse and they know exact, not know exactly what's going to go, but they've got a pretty good idea. Like, the people that I've met in these communities, the, the alpha, the different group chats, like, I'm messing around with meme coins just like most people are. And that's what I personally want to see from some of these NFT communities right now. You want to be around people who have an eye on what's going on, what might happen next, and be able to at least talk about the different cycles. Like, we want to be around people who have similar mindsets and, you know, similar ambitions, at least when in this industry. And uh, just to add on to something Fatty Bag said, bro, who is bringing people in with TikTok? Because they're about to have some ex exit liquidity. I need to get on that one. <laughs> Love it. And yeah, no, I'd settle for a 10x. I'd settle for a 2x, dude. I, I'm just getting, you know, what am I, what do I have? Um, and, and PR, what's up? I, I just do want to point out that we have seen some crazy runs on NFTs. They're just called ordinals. And like, it's not, ordinals is fun because it's like NFT has a negative connotation to some degree where people hear NFT and they think something. But like, we kind of saw this with meme coins. Like, it's it's literally, like, last cycle, you looked at, like, Safe Moon or, like... But, like, I was, I've been listening to the Safe Moon podcast. I'm obsessed with it. It's, like, these old people who work there. And when you hear them talk about... I think I'm, like, one of 12 listeners or something. But I love this love, show. I love this. And, but, like, I love... They have... They talk about, like, all these things that 
they were trying to do, like how John Caroni, the founder, was trying to like quote unquote yeet satellites into space. And like they were gonna do wind turbines and the Gambia and be a whole and it was too much. It was too much. They promised way too much. Right? And that project's probably dead right now, as a former safe moment army member. When because they promised all this stuff. And you look at ordinals, you look at puppets, you look at you know, node monks, what's the what are they promising? Like almost nothing. And you've seen that same rotation with meme coins where like Last cycle, Safe Moon goes to like 14 billion off all these promises. There's all these things, but it was too much, right? And so you now have like Whiff. What does Whiff do? It's a dog with a hat. It's fun. Like that's the thesis. And so I think that like meme coins are kind of, what's the word? We're seeing what's about to happen with NFTs, I think with meme coins right now, where like, and you've seen it with some of these ordinal projects where it's like, it's like really community based. It's about the alpha. It's about like finding like-minded people. And I think the simplification will just help. As, as someone that actually has an NFT collection that's going to the South Pole of the Moon on a SpaceX rocket in Q4, it is fucking so hard to even do that. And, and we, we're pulling it off and no one cares. Like, you know, so it's like, it, it's almost like the utility like the more utility and more crazy shit you do, it's like sometimes it's hey, just keep it simple. You know, if you guys want to go follow that project, it's at Nakamoto underscore one, or if you search Treasure Chest on Etherscan, you'll see what we will fill our bags in the year. So I'm not lying about that. But I also love, by the way, the Safe Moon comment. Like I've always thought about writing a book one day called Series F, which is called Ser- it's just Series Fucked, and it's just a bunch of stories about all the crazy shit that these founders did when they like came into way too much money. Um, Zeds, go ahead, and then Fatty Bags. Yeah, I'll go back to a point there that, that David mentioned. I, and I think that, you know, there's a, there's a lot of founders who uh, they've been complaining. Um, you know, obviously, when you put so much work into to your NFT project and, and you've been building for such a long time to see the value sort of be uh, exited from, from that asset to go into meme coins, it can be frustrating. But there has been a, a few founders and a few projects who, who have actually pivoted. And, and the way they provided value and kept their value is by providing alpha to, to the community, by rallying around and uh, and going with, you know, the, the recent trend. Um, and I've seen a really good, you know, a few good examples of projects doing that, are ones who have really just been focusing on the current trend of meme coins, ones who have been making the community a lot of money, um, and ones who don't really need to, to do anything while this is happening. So, uh, again, I do think it's about, you know, just pivoting to the current market because these markets change so fast, and they always will do. Um, and second point as well, like so I mentioned um, about ordinals, you know, ordinals are essentially just just NFTs, but a different word. So they, you know, all these these Bitcoin pup- uh, Bitcoin puppets, the other ordinals that are getting a lot of attention. There is it's purely just a, a speculation play. Like there is zero promises. You know exactly what you're buying into, and ultimately it's it's the community and culture that that comes around that. So uh, I do very I do think you know in this market um, less is more. I, but to be fair, I think I'd always argue that that less is more. Um, I think that you know people need to just understand exactly what your project is about and what it's doing. Uh, and the more complexities that that you add into that, the more barriers of entry that that comes along with that as well. 100%. Fatty Bags, what are your thoughts on Zillion? And then I'd love if anyone's got like a steel man. I mean, obviously, we're all like pretty bullish up here, but like maybe a steel man around, you know, why, wh- why, what is bearish about what's happening? And why maybe will NFTs not make it? Appreciate it, Joe. Yeah, there's, we're really touching on overpromise fatigue is what it really comes down to. And it was really a meta uh, throughout the years of, you know, look, we've got something and we're kind of building the plane as this thing flies. And we got to come up with an idea and that kind of pressure on founders, it speaks, uh, it speaks a lot to a couple things. One, it's you're, like I said, you're building the plane while you're flying. You don't really know what you're doing, which is a dangerous way of going about things. There are many times when I've sat in spaces and there's a new project and that new project is just over promising. Uh, and the idea is to over promise and under deliver in this space. Oh, <laughs> I take that back. The idea is to under, under promise, over deliver in this space. God for save your soul. If you do the other, um, Lower the expectations uh, to allow founders to flourish. That's another thing. Communities truly 
Um, they expect so much so quick in this space because we've created this massive amount of dopamine injection uh, based off of this hype and these quick cycles and these things that happen so fast, boom, 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 uh, that founders are left to create something very quick uh, to expend liquidity on ideas maybe that they haven't thought through. Uh, and then you have you know, community members who are then left thinking, oh, well, this wasn't exactly what I want. So if you think about traditional companies, it takes time to build something great. Uh, and Web3, I think, would be a lot better uh, if we as community members, one, lower our expectations a little bit, give give founders breathing room, but also founders to make sure that they're not over-promising. Uh, that way there's a balance or a dichotomy there that makes sense. Uh, like I said, it takes time uh, to build something really great. So I appreciate you guys. Great, great stuff. And yeah, normally startups go through a seed run, pre-seed, seed, series A, B, C, and then they go public like seven to 10 years into it. With meme coins, it's like you're just going, a group of like four people in a hotel room are just going public on day one and they're just losing their shit. Zillion, go ahead. Yeah, uh, I just want to take uh, this discussion a little bit back in time. Um, and I think this, this will show us a uh, little, little something about this space. Um, uh, er, really early on, you know, after the Ethereum ICO, etc., uh, you had a lot of focus on utility. So you had people really building the next big themes, privacy, uh, things like that, right? And after that, we had the ICO boom, which basically any idea under the sun of utility, okay, that has utility in it, was basically ICO win, right? And after that, we start seeing diminishing utility. So after that, we start seeing uh, 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 stuff like, well, we start seeing DeFi, et cetera, obviously with some utility there. But right there, at that point, we start seeing, you know, things such as NFTs, right? And NFTs are fantastic to build cults. So whoever one, I think one is the best use case of, of, of NFTs is to build cults. And, and NFTs, for me, as I understood them when I first saw them, was basically a new form factor of ownership attestation, right? So, and that could be deployed to a lot of use cases. Obviously, these use cases in the, in the, in the NFT space are very hard to build because in order to build a proper cult, it's, it's a tough thing, right? Uh, in order to build a proper utility and to convince, for example, uh, notary organizations, or a title or a real estate uh, deeds to be issued, you know, as, at the governmental level to be issued uh, with a form factor of NFTs, etc., is, is is a tough uh, quest. And 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 what really keeps us from building those really tough problems and solving those really tough problems is the early financialization that this space benefits from. Um, there was a study back in the day made that companies when they first IPO. Their leadership productivity drops by about 20 to 30 percent. Why? Because the leadership spends time watching the stock price. Can you imagine at the level of, of, of really early startups when they early, when they financialize, even without having a product out there? It, it's, it's very tough from a psychological perspective to be sitting. And a lot of these founders, they sit, if they're successful, they sit on tens of millions of dollars going from zero. So productivity, you need to forget about it. Unless you're a hyper-focused person, there is no way you can build and tackle big problems unless some type of miracle. This is why we see very far in between successes. Right. And now we're getting at a level where tokens are launched with no utility. Let's just speculate. Let's just go crazy. We're not going to promise anything, etc. which is, in a sense... We're coming back to the essence and the core value of this thing, which is at the end of the day, people that bought in uh, at the hard uh, uh, use cases or bought in at the meme coins, they're looking at one thing is capital appreciation. And I think that as we advance in this environment and as we, uh, as obviously regulation steps in, as we have more selectivity, etc., you're going to start having uh, 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 entrepreneurs that raise money being forced to focus on the problem because if, you don't, if they don't focus on the problem, there will be consequences. And this is, this is what I wanted to say. All right. Good stuff. But you ever you can't spell culture without cult. Making that's that right. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, I'm happy to take the other side of the argument for a minute and, and talk sort of objectively 
um, about this situation um, and to say, no, mo most NFTs won't make it. Most artists won't make it. And mo most artists won't break out of the, the mainstream. I'm sorry, of the, of the Web3 into the mainstream. Um, but that's true pretty much in any like business or artistic culture. Um, you just have like 0.1 or even less, 0 0.01 in some circumstances breaking out and actually making big waves. Um, and I think that there is definitely like a cultural issue with NFTs. I mean, if you want to break into the mainstream, there, you have to shake this sort of multi-year <laughs> uh, overhang of like, NFTs are a scam, NFTs are a grift, NFT, like, there's a lot of people out there, especially in, like, gaming culture, that feel NFTs are poison, right? So how do you, how do you shake that, and how do you, how do you break free of that? that that's going to be the, on, the onus on these founders to, to get past, um, and I think some of them will do it. The problem is, and I, this kind of echoes what was just said, is the... <laughs> The projects are trying to essentially speed run a, an IP business, right? A lot of them. And if you look at something like Star Wars, which started before most of the people on stage were even born. <laughs> um, if you look at something like Disney, which is like over 100 years old. Um, or even Pokemon, which is 25 years old. Um, that's a long time to build an IP library, deliver on things, fail, succeed... Um, and, and put yourself in many, many different places. Obviously, Pokemon was a show, and it was a card game, and then a movie, and toys, etc., 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 and it goes on and on. But, like, that takes years, and the people that were collecting Pokemon cards in the beginning, myself included, had no idea that a Charizard would be worth 100 grand when I was 25 or 30, whatever it was. Um, it wasn't being collected for that reason. So... I can't agree more with, with what was said. Like, it, you have to start by building culture versus building speculative value. And not a lot of people are going to like that in crypto. It's just like the, the nature of this space. People just want fast gains. There's like an element of financial nihilism that we've been talking about here on the stage in a subtle fashion. People are skipping the, the utility aspect of these of everything. In previous cycles, I've been in this space for 11 years. In previous cycles, we at least pretended that we wanted to do something with these assets. <laughs> you know, in 2017, you would write a white paper, you'd have a really fancy website, a video. Like, it was presented as if it were going to be a real company. 99% of them were fake, vaporware, and didn't go anywhere, and some did. And some of those coins are still some of the most powerful uh, ecosystems in, in crypto, but a lot of them are not. This cycle, it's like, nah, screw that. We're just going to skip and and forget. Like, <laughs> we're not going to revolutionize finance. We're not going to beat the banks. We're not going to do anything philosophically strong. We're just going to jump right to the part where we make 100x. And that culture doesn't last very long. Um, and that's why the, a lot of people are calling for a left-translated cycle this, this cycle. But if we can break that as a NFT community, if we can focus on culture, and if you look at things like Miladies, they've kind of done that. You know, it's it's not utility driven. It's purely just a community of, of you know, schizos or whatever they call themselves. Um, more of that, less of the speculative. Get to the point where it's valuable. Get to the point where the IP yeah. is, is desirable. That's my yeah. That's good stuff. I, I like your uh, yeah. It's kind of like the proverbial: we walked uphill both ways to school. At least we at least we pretended we cared about. <laughs> just good stuff. NPR. Yeah, and. Uh like, I know it sounds like I'm super bullish on NFTs, and I am, but, like, I, because I do these, like, rankings, and I keep a, I have a spreadsheet of all the active projects in the space, right? And that number that I've, quote-unquote, called active has diminished, cr like, crazy in two years. It went from, you know, hundreds of projects to now I think I have 72, Right? I think that's like the total amount of active quote unquote projects in the space. And even within there, there are a bunch of projects that are dying and like are almost dead. And the reason is because they've, a lot of them have strayed from what they started with and, or they've, they're just not cool. It's like, you look at like a Moonbirds, 
right? And I'm sorry, Moonbirds holders. I'm really sorry about this. But, like, you just can't... That thing is... It's almost the negative sentiment is too high. Like, what are you going to... How are you going to fix that? People like, don't have a positive connotation with the project. And, like, you almost saw, like, we have youths up here. I love the direction that Frank has taken it. Where, like, they started as, like, essentially, if you remember, early D-Gods. It was essentially a frat. And frats are a big business. Like, it doesn't have to be more than that, in my opinion. And then they tried to do a SaaS company. They tried to do, like, almost way too much. And so it kind of lost its cool. But then you see Frank, like, kind of taking that back and going, no, we're not doing that. We're a frat again. And that's bullish to me. And so, yeah, like, a lot of these NFTs, they had culture, and then they lost it. And most of these things will go to zero, like, if we're just being really honest. Like, I think especially with ETH NFTs, the winners have been chosen to some degree. And those are the ones that I'm stacking up on personally. Like, especially, like, right now, it's like I'm watching the floors just go down and down and down and down and down. And it's like, people still want these. You know, you look at, like, motherfuckers, the, and they just had that base coin. And all of a sudden, everyone's bullish on them again. And it's just kind of like, yes, I like NFTs. I think they're amazing community building tools. I think that people get really attached to the photos. You have almost a different audience than meme coins with them. But it's not like you can just buy one and they're all going to go up in value. I think most will go down in value. But I think that it's it's the same as like 2017 ICOs. Like we saw in 2021 that most of those projects did not survive. Like they you know, they they died within that time period. But the ones that did, they're crazy successful now. And it's going to be the same thing, I think, with these NFTs. Yeah, it is, unfortunately, a it feels like it's a what have you done for me lately type of thing. But that, I mean, that makes sense as a brand a little bit, like you're trying to create new products and do new initiatives and innovate. And that's okay. I think what gets hard is that people think about maybe the word non-fungible or you launch a token and like, well, your original idea was this, you know, like I'm supposed to get access to this, you know, this event with this NFT. It's like, well, what if next month somehow we're like a Lamborghini manufacturer? Do you think you also maybe get access to that? And like, it's just an endless stream for one thing. I think it's a, it's a hard thing to think through. And it's like, it should be okay for these projects to iterate. And I tell you how Moonbird solves everything. They take 50,000 ETH of whatever is left in that treasury and they throw one $180 million party. That's what they do. They'll switch sentiment right away. Fatty bags. <laughs> you just solved all of the problems of Mr. Rose without any of the ketamine. Very, I mean, very... right? I mean, $180 million <laughs> party instantly. Floor Brother. price goes up. Yep, floor price goes yeah, up. Yeah, <laughs> A thousand percent, man. No, there's, there's some really good points uh, being made here. I think that... Um, you know, with this kind of rotation of liquidity we've been talking about and some of these projects fading, one thing that people, in my opinion, should pay attention to are these legacy collections. If we're talking NFTs here, um, the legacy collections, the first movers, the ones that made the most noise, although down now, um, I believe will hold their relevance due to having that first mover advantage due to being uh, the art that was on the tongue of everybody at the time. So something to really uh, think about there as we go through the ebb and flow of what we're seeing now um the other thing that we touched on was the memetics of marketing which is the true uh meta of web3 period memetic marketing is kind of the one tool set that we have i was the previous cmo of olympus dow uh last bull market and it was something that worked really well for us in a lot of ways while we were trying to build something that was you know truly full of utility for the space uh didn't pan out exactly but it's still around so it's a, a very interesting thing to look into memetics is web3 um there's another thing i wanted to touch on which was you know, the cult and tribalistic mentality uh, that is part of that marketing meta is a meta is really uh, the key to that is sustaining the tribe. Right. Um, so that's one thing that we, we look at, too, is how do you sustain the tribe? How do you keep them happy? How do you keep them fed? Uh, I think that's a million dollar question that no one has really answered perfectly because we see large uh, well, air quote companies uh, that have created these projects. And yet they're still trying to keep everybody happy. Again, dumbing shit down uh, is super important. Keeping it simple. The, fr the fraternity uh, mindset is big as well. Uh, and to circle around on a couple last points here. Um, the large collections, I'm going to go with the contrarian view where everyone's super bullish on NFTs. I'm a creator, founder, artist, all that shit. 
yada yada uh but i don't think that most of these nft projects will last i absolutely do not these large cap ridiculous animal fuck it we're running out of animal names number one guys we're running out of fucking animals i just want to put that up there like right now there's no more fucking animals going on so we've got this massive amount of 10k collections the dilution of shit art in the space all of that is going to fade eventually. There will always be a piece of the pie that people play with there so they can flip it and make their Taco Bell money. Uh, and I say that with all due respect because there are people in other countries where the you know the $10 gains are is really good money, and that's awesome. Uh, so I think those will always sustain. But ultimately, for the greater Web3 uh, you know, ecosystem, it's not going to be something that all of us are going to be focusing on that will have its own corner in the room. Um, I think there's a very important point to be made about the balance of accessibility versus exclusivity, uh, meaning that if you have a large collection, it's good for the ecosystem because you can onboard more people into that collection. You can get more people involved in your community. Um, but at the same time, uh, exclusivity is really good for the longevity of the tribe slash project that has created that. So if you're doing fine art or low cap collections or these ordinal uh, collections as well, that equals more uh, sustainability for what you're creating. So there's a balance, a really fine wire that needs to be walked there. Uh, and I think everyone's still just trying to figure that out. Go ahead, and NPR, and then we'll uh, we'll get to a little pitch here. We have Vinny up on stage from Sweep and Flip. Yeah, I, I hear you. I just I hate, I have to disagree just a little bit because the collection... expanding the collection almost to some degree where like I know we were sitting at like a point three. am I getting rugged or is he getting rugged a little bit for you guys too I think he's getting rugged Joe NPR if you can hear us give it give it one more go move closer to your window can you guys hear me now yeah we can okay perfect yeah I think that like what happened is a lot of these collections thought that it's better to be exclusive, where actually like a funnel into the ecosystem is really important. You've seen it with Miladies, you've seen it with Seals, like when you, in, even now Puppets, where when you embrace the derivatives, it actually helps your collection because you have all these people who get to join the community at a lower cost. And then honestly, like I can't tell you how many people have bought like a Seal derivative and then eventually go, I want to be a part of this like thing. So that's my only pushback. Like, my ladies have been super successful with this. Like, you look at all their derivatives, and, like, expanding the collection does help. Like, more people getting, like, a little taste of the ecosystem before actually, like, diving in is super valuable, I think. No, great stuff. And fatty bags, I mean, it's it's tough to say that there can't be any meme coin any more meme coin names. I mean, it just took me two seconds to type it into chat GPT. You know, give me the, an outrageous meme coin that, you know, is way, that, that has an un, unbelievable, extravagant $180 million party. And now I've got Galactic Unicorn. It <laughs> transcends reality. I've got a massive custom built floating space station replica with gravity chamber. I mean, I'm buying. Joe, Joe, I'm so sorry. I, I, I think you might have misunderstood me. I just meant the the amount of animal PFPs, which again, I think we could probably just fucking chat GPTM, dude, and have you know, another 10,000 ready to go. Can you just imagine it's just AIs on top of AIs just launching these tokens incessantly? I mean, are we headed there? <laughs> I'm pretty damn sure we are, man. At the rate the AI is growing, yeah, we're, we're close. It's right around the corner, man. Awesome. Well, I think we'll, we'll wait for Vinny to get back up to the stage here, but, you know, I'd love just, you know, any more kind of thoughts from you guys on, you know, where, where we're kind of headed here in the, in the short term, you know, there's a lot of like macro things happening, but like in this community with NFTs, where we headed, Nikki, go ahead. Yeah, I know we've talked a lot about PFP collections during this space, but I do want to highlight fine art collections, which have been absolutely crushing it recently. Um, across all the different blockchains. A lot of gen generative art collections um, are still holding up really well against Solana, against ETH. Um, and, and a lot of those artists are, are leveraging those collections to 
bring in, um, you know, new users to the space, new utility, so to speak, for their for their holders, you know, airdrops and things like that is what I mean with, with utility, nothing really crazy. But I think it's a great way for, um, for artists who are, have like multidisciplinary skill sets to access new collectors. Um, you know, they're dropping 500 to 1000, sometimes more uh, generative art collections, and they're selling out really quickly. Um, they're these there's something that you just kind of hold. I mean, we saw great success back in the day with art blocks and, and the like. Um, so I think there's a there's a significant place in Web3 for those kinds of uh, of collections and for fine artists to continue to access the uh, the community in this in this ecosystem. I just wanted to throw that out there so we're not fully just PFP focused. No, I like it. Makes sense. Anyone else got some thoughts on just the next, you know, 30, 60 days, are we going to see anything? You know, are there any big launches that you guys are paying attention to um, that are like strictly like NFT based that you're stoked on? Zeds, go ahead. I'm going to have to show my own bags here. Um, I'm joking, but yeah, we've been we've been working. I've been working on a, a project called uh, Hermans. Uh, we'll be launching on Solana. No date as of yet. Um, we've been working on it past past six months, um, and obviously that you know we was nowhere near ready to launch uh, or, or ready to start the marketing. But, you know, we're, you know, waiting for a, for a better time, we could have been waiting forever. So we just decided to, to, to get things going. Now, what we, when we took a, took a look back and, and looked at other projects that have launched recently, um, one of the things that I don't think anyone has really looked at doing is, is actually curating the community. And I don't know that people have tried, you know, there was, uh, the youth list, which has questionnaires, but ultimately, you know, when you ask people questions, people lie. So the one thing that we're going to be looking at doing, and which is already built by by our dev team, um, he's built a, a basically a, a bot which will be able to curate the community based on on chain data. Um, and I think this is a is a good way to to really bring in uh, the community uh, members with the behaviours that that you're looking to bring in. So, for example, um, the duration of of NFT holdings. Now we can, you know, through connecting Matrica uh, and not the wallet directly, uh, we can pull data from uh, the likes of Ordinals, uh, Ethereum, Solana, uh, all these different chains uh, and be able to give uh, an actual score on how long you've been holding NFTs, the duration and the, the amount of NFTs you hold, what type of NFT projects uh, you hold as well. So um, that's one thing that, that we're excited to, to, to be rolling out. I think it's it's a really good way for us to be able to sort of curate the, the members that, that we want in um, and something that's not really been, been done before. Um, you know, obviously the, the, the usual matter is over allocate, do a load of pre-sales uh, to all these specific DAOs. But ultimately, I think if you follow the same the, the, the same path that every other recent collection has followed, then you're going to expect to see the, the same result. Um, and really, we've just been, you know, going back to going back to basics, you know, what what really works, how to build a community, the type of marketing, the type of, you know, the, the focus points, such as uh, community content, all that stuff, uh, and just basically simplifying the process uh, without any bullshit uh, promises. Um, so uh, obviously, a bad bias, but we're, we're certainly looking forward to, uh, to rolling it out. No, that's great. Uh, we do have uh, Vinny up here. Vinny, I can't say your full name. Um, but uh, welcome to the stage from uh, Sweep and Flip. Um, did want to give you the uh, the the table here uh, to talk a little bit about what you guys are working on, and then if any of the speakers have questions for you. Uh, but fire it off, man. What are you guys working on? All righty then. We can't hear or just me? I, I, I can't hear either, so I think yeah, it's on, on him. He's got to unmute. Uh, can Julian, I jump in? Got something? Yeah. Go for it. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, yeah. Just uh, no, we're uh, we're just building a, an NFT graveyard. Uh, it's part of our uh, coin graveyard uh, deployment, which will probably come uh, in the next uh, two three months. The idea here is to help uh, 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 is to help failed NFT communities and entrepreneurs to dissolve in orderly manner. And give their, the the ability to their communities to uh, recover eventually some of their values by taking in the failed NFTs. Uh, this is basically what we're doing from an NFT perspective, and I think there is a great community there to capture because the essence of all what we're doing here is really uh, building communities and uh, and uh, and and building value around communities. That's great. Maybe we need some mergers. Fatty bags. Yeah. 
<laughs> Why not? I'll keep it. I'll keep it super short, super sweet. I'm not going to say the name of it. You can go to my uh, my profile if you want to see it. It's definitely not a PG name, but we're we're taking it back. Uh, me and the DeFi guys of Last Bull Run. Uh, they created Barra Chain, which is an L1 uh, right now. The test net's up, but we're going to be launching probably the most. The, one of the first collections on that chain. There's no promises, no utility, no nothing. 90s Rugrat, Ren and Stimpy vibes, total degenerate, just absolute shit show. Uh, and it's me and Josh Brandit, who are two Reddit artists as well. So it's just an art project, but definitely want to put that out there. Thanks for letting me say that, Joe. Awesome. Ren and Stimpy, I haven't heard that in forever. NPR. Yeah, and I just want to say I would pay attention to puppets right now. Uh, I think something really special is going on with that collection. Like, uh, I'm super bullish on this, like, shitty art on purpose. Like, I think it's, like, fine art is so hard. Like, how do you make sure that everyone thinks your art is sick? Like, that's, that's so tough. Like, every time I've seen collections attempt to, like, be, like, the fine art collection, especially with PFP, it just doesn't work. Like... It's really hard. It's so subjective. But those puppets are so ugly. Like, it's so bullish. Like, it's... I saw them, and I was like, this is cool. Like, I, rem I remembered them. Like, and I think, like, you're seeing Ansem show them right now, who's, like, kind of the god of crypto, right, at the moment. But it's been a long... I don't think he's just showing them out of nowhere. Like, I know that, like, a lot of our SEAL people, we've been in since, like, $600 or something like that. And it's, like, they don't want to sell. They're, like, I think they're having, like, a really interesting run. And the PUPS token will probably end up being, like, the main Bitcoin shitcoin. I don't know. I, but I would watch that collection. Like, it's... It's really, really interesting what they're doing. It's like, and the whole world peace thing is hilarious, which is like their whole, like, what's the utility? And they're like, we're trying to do world, like, world peace. I'm like, that's, I don't know. <laughs> There's collections that, like, that cracks me up. Like, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm watching them, like, really closely. And I think, like, you're watching, like, Node Monks, which is, like, kind of, like, the de facto 10K collection. They seem a little bit threatened by these puppets. So, I, they're hilarious. I mean, like, look at how ugly they are. Like, I love it. Sometimes that's what that that's what drives it. It's just hideous, and you're like, I need to have that. All right, sad sad creator, you're up from Tearful Tadpoles as a sponsor. It's we we are a the rails are off. This is a hard shill session that we are part of now. So we need a very hard <laughs> shill. Do not sugarcoat it. <laughs> hey guys, uh, Sad Creator here. Uh, excited for this opportunity. Uh, great points today on state of NFTs. Um, I love the narrative uh, that meme coins are being replaced, uh, or sorry, the replacement of NFTs um, as people cycle their funds into memes that are often lower commitment uh, based on both liquidity and entry price. Uh, today I want to introduce a DM404 project that I've been working on called Swim. Um, it sort of combines conservation with crypto, uh, so I think Pandora meets something positive. Um, in a nutshell, 1 million swim tokens were minted. Um, every 200 of them yields an NFT of a tier 4 tap pool. Uh, by holding 200 swim tokens in your wallet, you automatically mint an NFT. If your balance falls below 200, you burn that NFT, but obviously you still keep your tokens. Um, so if you want to keep re-rolling your NFT trades, just keep buying and selling that one swim token. Um, sort of a way to incentivize trading volume, I suppose, uh, with this native fractionalization. Um, this is also why I think these 4 for contracts are probably going to bring NFT back um, a little bit, sort of competing with meme coins. Um, you kind of have the liquidity of meme coins, but at the same time, you have something to hold on to, to, to sort of, um, you know, look towards. It's also to speak to earlier points where, you know, it's a, a little taste of the community before going all in. Uh, so tokens are currently traded on Thruster uh, on the Blast network. We're distributing 100% of our developer points and Blast Gold uh, to our holders, uh, where all the fees and gains we make from provisional liquidity and stuff go straight to conservation of exomodos in Mexico. Uh, today, we've donated over $10,000 uh, to the effort, and we aim to overtake their entire year's uh, funding in 2023 within the next two months. Uh, so yeah, token launched uh, at about $1.50. Now it's trading at 2.1, so definitely still early. Uh, I can mint a tearful tapu and... Support a great cause. Uh, follow swim underscore 404. 
Good stuff. Maybe you could talk just a little bit about like a DN404 um, yeah. you know, and, and what that what that is. Yeah, yeah. For those who you know are, are maybe not familiar with it, um, <clears throat> I think DN404 is probably something that um, it is a bit of a game changer for digital collectibles. Um, if you really think about things like apes, punks, uh, you essentially build a social club capped at 10,000 members. I know you guys covered the subject already a little bit, but um, you know, any subsequent offering to me is sort of treated like secondary citizens, so like mutant apes and stuff like that, little pudgies. Um, so I think with fractional ownership, uh, like DM404s or, or like Pandora ERC404, um, it's, it's, um, predecessors um you can kind of kind of control how much stake you have in a particular pool um at the end um if it's traded on dex you have liquidity right you have everything provided by an amm an automated market maker uh so you can acquire as much or as little as you want um of this asset and i think uh the added bonus is obviously the ability to reroll your traits uh that's something that you can't do with apes right um and then you know i think i think for us um having this ability incentivizes your volume it incentivizes people to come and keep swapping things out, uh, maybe sending their prized possession, your prized traits to a different wallet, which adds to your wallet account, which adds to decentralization, which in a way I think pushes the collection closer to a central exchange, uh, centralized exchange listing, just because one of the metric for listing on CEX, as you all know, is how many unique wallet holders you have, right? So I think uh, by design, DN404s, um, you know, I think sort of uh, plays into the hands of, um, you know, adoption and, and um, uh, you know, NFTs being back into spotlight. Um, DM404, by the way, it's an evolution of ERC404. So if you're familiar with Pandora, one of the biggest problems um, is gas fees, obviously. Um, it's just not written properly, I want to say. Um, DM404 essentially splits that smart contract in two. So essentially, um, it's a more efficient way of, of running the exact same native um, um, fractionalization. Um, and this is sort of how I think the M404 is really overtaking that original contract. Good stuff. Any speakers got any questions on, on that at all? I, I sure wish I didn't have or, all my ordinals in different wallets because I didn't get any runestones, so I got screwed. But um, <laughs> <any> <laughs> Yeah, no, it's funny because like, you know, ordinals are like even more brainless than, than NFTs, right? So, you know, that has really ignited a huge spark and obviously with all the airdrops and stuff like that. Um, things are a little bit different, uh, but from a project perspective, obviously, all of us are aiming to to be able to list on centralized exchanges. Um, and, and you know, one of the metrics is definitely going to be how many people are holding your your tokens. Um, and I think like we haven't really seen any big, you know, Binance, Coinbase listings uh, for for DM four hundred fours um, or even ERC four hundred four. So we're trying to ex we're trying to figure out um, how to get there more efficiently. So from a project perspective, I think uh, people should start. I guess, um, incentivizing multiple wallet holding rather than kind of, hey, look, we're going to airdrop you based on how many, how fat your one wallet is. Makes sense. Fatty Bags, you got a question or a comment? Yeah, just a quick statement. Um, I know that when intelligent individuals and developers, I run a blockchain development studio as well, when we start doing innovative stuff, it's very easy to almost zone out and not understand it and, and fearfully just kind of not research it so when an intelligent person like sad is up here talking about something like this i encourage everyone to reach out send him a dm send his team a dm if you don't understand it and dig in because a lot of the time the innovative shit sounds so wild that we don't get it but in turn it might be some of the coolest shit for the space so i just wanted to put that out there yeah i think there's like some change in the industry as well right so like where we're seeing, like, look at Mavia, look at all these gaming companies coming up here, combining NFTs. Um, I think, like, PFPs are, are sort of joining forces with, like, GameFi. Um, you know, recently I had a conversation with uh, with Lorenzo and Zach from the Pudgy Penguin team as well. Um, and, you know, from from my perspective, I created Sad Creator um, <laughs> just about a year ago as a um, sort of, like, um, just, just like a fun thing to do. Um, I started writing on Medium. Um, you know, in, in real life, I've, I've launched a few projects that are on Binance and Coinbase, but I wanted to create something new so I can be unbiased when I write. Um, you know, I have to always, you know, speak towards, you know, be PR trained if I use my real identity. So that's why I created this. Um, and, you know, we've been we've been chatting with a bunch of projects uh, that we've supported over the past. And, you know, from, from my, my sort of like sad creative persona, I, I spoke with the Penguin team and, and for them, you know, we're working on something where, you know, again, my, my whole persona is about conservation. So I'm trying to, you know, give back to the community, give back to the world. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we, we were chatting with them and, you know, all of them are sort of trying to figure out how to take that PFP 
now build a game, launch a token. Um, you know, I think earlier in this chat, people talked about how, you know, with meme coins and stuff, you kind of go public and, um, you know, all of a sudden you don't have that series A, series B, or even a seed round, um, before you, but I think like that narrative is slowly shifting, right? Um, if you look at NFTs being the seed funding where it's stress-free, there's no investors, um, there's no token price to support, um, and you essentially have all these investors, um, who are buying your NFT, supporting your cause, and then you go build a game, build really good tokenomics, and then you launch a token and airdrop these NFT holders. Um, that's sort of like, you know, rewarding your seed round investors. And this way, when you list a token, mm -hmm. finally, things have support. Mm -hmm. right? So that was... Oops. Keep, keep, okay. Okay. keep going, Sidecreator. I don't know if you were done. Yeah, yeah. so I, I was just down. thinking, like, you know, as, as, as you see this, you know, project, own, project owners, project founders joining forces with PFPs, where all that community can be activated, right? You have you have all these airdrops coming. Um, why don't we launch a token um, properly over time? You don't have a lot of pressure from investors to to be listed within four months, five months, um, and then have that token dumped to nothing because there's, no, there's no utility. You have the funding from the NFT PFP sale already. You build out that IP. You build out that game. Um, so yeah, you know that's something that that we've been we've been talking about working on. Where you know after swim potentially you stake swim tokens to sort of farm the new play to earn penguin game token and then with that um you sort of start building that one step at a time progression towards a bigger and a bigger ip um like they did with pokemon or for example uh, towards centralized exchange listing where all your community can can sort of celebrate with a bigger uh piece of the pie or, or i guess the bigger pie um in, in this particular case um so you know i think i think things are are, are looking good for nfts um and, and they're they're certainly not dead 100%. Well, I really appreciate all your thoughtfulness there. And yeah, it's really interesting to think about the model and like the venture model and how it's changed and how it's going to continue to adapt. And, you know, these young kids, I don't, I don't know what they're, they're literally calling the next generation after Gen Z, <laughs> um, but like they're, they're getting into it and, you know, they're going to launch as like you're saying, small NFT project, then it could turn into mm -hmm. a, like a meme token that could turn into a utility token. And then maybe one day they're creating and training like large language models against something and they're the new google yeah <laughs> like it's just a different model yeah i think with money people start getting more creative um obviously there's a lot of rug pulls out there um but if you think about it right like um you, you look at pepe coin you look at all of these things you know they started with nothing but eventually they, the money has to go somewhere and i think naturally people don't exactly just rug the community um and you know with like every 100 or every 150 tokens, there might be one or two that actually evolves into something super interesting. You know, I, I wouldn't be surprised if Pepe buys an AI firm and now funds, you know, AI research outside of Microsoft or, or Facebook, right? That could really, you know, you're not beating the banks anymore. You're beating, you're beating big tech companies using meme coin tokens. And I think that's a fun culture thing too. Yeah, and, cre and the attention creator economy. Like I saw today that like uh, the YouTube channel Dude Perfect raised $100 million. Mm -hmm. Like I'm, I'm looking towards the day where like Dude Perfect buys, you know, some sort of retail brand. Like maybe they buy Reebok versus the other way around. Um, it's yeah. going to happen. Yeah, I think we're, I mean, that's, that's sort of what Mean Point is doing, right? If you really think about it, like last, at the end of last cycle, everybody's pitching friend tech and social fi and all sorts of stuff. If you see pouring all their money into it, but Mean Coins kind of did all that without writing a single line of code, right? You really have social fi rallying behind a meme token nothing had to be built at all the narrative was right but i think the vc backing all these projects going to zero now uh probably had it wrong uh because i think it's culturally driven it's community driven uh rather than cash driven love it well sad dude you rock we're gonna have to do like a whole nother segment with you um we do have <laughs> like Vinny. Vinny, can you hear us down there yes yes ma'am i can all right the, the microphones interwebs go ahead what are you working on so uh, my name is Vinicius. I'm a co-founder of Sweep and Flip. Sweep and Flip is an NFT DEX that brings DeFi AMMs to the NFT ecosystem, increasing liquidity and volume of NFT collections. And talking about the problem we solve, most of you might have come across challenges with liquidity when dealing with NFTs, such as the big difference between the best offer and the actual floor price, or even the lack of any liquidity for selling them. And these are common problems of the order books, these primitive technology mostly found in the main traditional marketplaces. And this is where Super and Flip steps in. We've taken inspiration from automated market makers that revolutionized DeFi back in 2020. And we are applying 
this similar concept to NFTs. Uh, so Serpent Flip functions as this traditional AMM, drawing inspiration from Uniswap V2, but with a focus on facilitating transactions involving floor NFTs. So you can think of it as the, the Uniswap V2 for floor NFTs. We simplify trading. You can buy or sell NFTs instantly and earn trading fees by being this liquidity provider. And we believe we are the perfect tool to increase the NFT liquidity, boost trading volume of the NFT ecosystem, especially on second layers. So our main focus now is should to deploy on the main layer twos and starting to bootstrap the collections there, boosting their trading volume and uh, making the, this whole ecosystem uh, big there, you know. So we are multi-chain, uh, like, like, like uh, we are deployed on nine uh, EVM chains. And in did our get map, rugged again, have, or did I get rugged this time? Hanging out uh, of thread. Uh, he's okay. speaking, but I don't think you can hear him. Oh, I, I can't hear. Can you hear me? I don't think Joe can hear you then. Oh. Should I leave and come? come I think I'm bootstrap too. My screen is just showing black. I can't is tell. Is anyone else hearing Vin? I heard him. Okay, yeah, I'm hearing you, Vin. You maybe step down and have Joe pull you back up, and if not, I'll let Joe know uh, when you're done speaking. Hey, Joe, I'm going to step down too and come back up. Okay. Uh, sh sh should I wait a, a while? Joe, you can hear me, yeah. Oh, I think I am back. Did I? Did I get? I think it was me that got rugged, or did you guys all get can rugged you hear as well? Me, Joe? Yeah, I can. I can hear you, Joe, but we can't hear Vinny. Oh, Vinny was the one that got rugged. So yeah, I'll Vinny, leave it. Yeah, hop down, and Joe will pull you. Twitter right back space is rugging and hurting. Vinny, give us a. <laughs> he's gonna go down and go back up again. We are struggle bussing with the fucking mics on Twix on Twitter today. This is just. Yo, Elon. What the heck, bro? We'll give it. A, we'll give him a minute here. We had Origin up, that he was down. Now he's back up. All right, we're just gonna we're gonna cut it here. <laughs> um, you guys all rock. This was a lot of fun. Um, I think I I learned a lot. You know, here we might have to do this one again. I don't know, Vinny. Vinny, are you back? Hey, you want to finish? Up? You want to? All right, maybe you finish your, you know, you're, you're paying for a lot of this oh, stuff geez. here. Keep pitching <laughs> us on it. We are here for it, man. Okay. We're just trying great, to great. get past these technical so, difficulties. Just to, to finish, uh, I, like I said, we are this Uniswap V2 for floor NFTs. We simplify trading. People can provide liquidity, buy and even sell NFTs. They are instantly and earn trading fees by being this liquidity provider. And we are this perfect tool to increase NFT liquidity, boost trading volume, especially on layer twos. We are deployed on nine EVM uh, chains, and we have a roadmap full of amazing innovation, including being a cross chain platform and building our own NFT bridge. Uh, we are completely focused on boosting and uh, increasing the liquidity of the NFT ecosystem on layer twos, and better. Thank you so much for for hearing us, despite all of these technical issues. But you <laughs> all good questions. Yeah, all good. So, is there is there a way where, like, obviously it says sweep and then flip? I'm imagining like I could put in some sort of signal or something where, if I'm setting some prices, where maybe from like a, a non technical person could come in and sweep some floors and flip those for prices. Yes, exactly. Uh, our first tool on this platform was this sweep and flip tool that gives the platform's name. Uh, so you, you can sweep the floor price NFTs of a specific connection and you set a target profit. And then you can flip them all automatically on OpenSea, on Blur, or on any other marketplace of your choice. So we make it easier for people to flip NFTs in our platform. It's the, the perfect tool for flipping. It's very simple, just like, like I said, you sweep, set a target profit, and then 
flip them all automatically. Teddy bags, go ahead. Uh, Vinny, is it possible? Uh, do you guys have it programmed in to where it's able to flip on multiple platforms at the same time for the best prices? Yeah, you have the option to select uh, more than one marketplace to flip them. So uh, you can choose, for, for example, on Ethereum, Blur, OpenSea, uh, X2Y2, and you can choose between many others in the other chains as well. Good stuff. I couldn't even hear Fatty Bags your question there, so I just waited patiently until Vinny started speaking again. So it looks like it looks like we're through it. Well, uh, amazing stuff, man. Uh, appreciate it. Everyone, give Vinny a follow there. Check out Sweep and Flip. Uh, looks really cool. Um, sweep and Flip .io. Sweep n the letter n flip dot io. Good stuff, man. Um, looks like we finally got a third sponsor up on stage. Gold Dow. What's up? Hello, How's hello going? guys. Hello, guys. Here presenting the Gold Dow. Um, thank you guys for having us. Um, we're doing a project around LWBA and NFTs, obviously, are linked to that. So, what we are trying to achieve and we are, what we are doing is creating um, using the Origin technology that is a project based on ICP. Uh, we're creating certificates of ownership of specific billions. And those certificates are then NFTs, and they represent then the ownership of a real billion, so a physical one. And everything is stored in Switzerland. And what we are trying to do is not tokenize gold in the same way that it was done before, as you usually take a gold and then you fractionalize it. Here we are doing something a bit different. So we're using NFTs to make a, fung a non-fungible token. So the gold bullion obviously has a serial number that makes it um, completely, uh, so make it completely non-fungible. And then we create a certificate that gives you the ownership of that bullion. And inside of the certificate is a lot of data. So we're using the storage capacity of ICP to store all that data that gives you details of what the billion is. So you have every detail uh, with biomet biometric photographies of the billions. And um, the certificates are then used uh, to, to have been sold uh, through a marketplace, so as NFTs. And when you own the certificate, so when you have the NFT in your wallet, let's say, then you are the owner of that specific billion. And uh, this is a huge topic that I think we haven't talked really on here about NFTs. I think NFTs is a great technology that can be used um, to not only do like PFTs and all that we have talked here that I think are great and brings a lot of value to the technology that is behind it. But um, the way that Origin works, and I think it's that uh, that makes it really interesting, is that you can create like a digital twin of an object. And today, LWA, um, so real world assets, is a big trend. And there's a lot of things happening behind the scenes around that. And um, yeah, so I, I, will, I will say that. I don't know what you guys um, uh, think about LWA and NFTs, but not we shouldn't use only NFTs for... Um, PFP, but real taking those technologies and make it work for real cases, and that's what we are trying to achieve today. Be uh, I'd be it'd be pretty cool if I can use sweep and flip to sweep the floor of a bunch of Rolexes. Maybe that hit, you know, that like on. I, I think there's like something very interesting about creating a marketplace for real world assets on like much smaller markets or collectibles and items. I think like. There's a really interesting company that kind of they like securitize and sell off like parts of like a 69 Camaro or like different cars and things like that, which I think is really interesting. But, you know, those are all centralized services. And so it's like what's like the, the kind of like the big vision for you guys with this, you know, obviously in the real world asset landscape. Is it like marketplaces? Is it having more than gold? Like what is the what's kind of the vision that you guys are thinking through? 
So the idea behind it, I think what is really interesting today um, is decentralization is and transparency is what keeps this possible. Because if we didn't have those like those things, we couldn't do what we are trying to achieve. So we don't want to have a system where let's let's take gold for example. You can buy gold in different ways, but in this matter, you only are um, you are really the owner of what you got, and making it um, decentralized and transparent is what makes it um, being able to trace the object. And the way that you do it is by putting a lot of information on the object. You cannot do an NFT uh, with only like a few data on it. You need like a lot of data that could make it really link to the object so you need all that data to be on chain and to be transparent and people need to be able to access that data and that's what makes it possible if you had it like the data somewhere else that you cannot really trust it so the trust that is behind is what makes it possible so you need to be able and blockchain is that blockchain today i think is the technology that inspires trust that you don't need this a third person saying this exists or this doesn't exist. So utilizing that technology that is blockchain and creating an NFT that has a lot of data that is stored on chain and could be not like changed or modified, then you could use that um, to be able to link the object to the NFT. Daddy bags question. Yeah, quick question. Uh, two things. One is the uh, the gold physically redeemable, and two, where is this data stored? Uh, is it standard metadata? Is this immutable? What's what's the deal with that? Just curious. Yeah, sure. So the gold is definitely remutable. The idea here is if everything crashes, you still have the NFT, and then you're it's you're the owner, and the billion exists because it has a serial number. So you can go anywhere, and you can take that gold. Um, obviously, it's yours because you are the owner. And that certificate of ownership is what makes it redeemable. And then for your other question, um, uh, sorry, what was the question? Sorry, I, I got lost answering. As far as the, the data of the gold, so the biometric oh, yeah. scans, any of the okay. serial numbers, yeah, yeah, where perfect. is that stored? So everything is, I don't know if you are like familiar with ICP uh, uh, blockchain. So we are using ICP today because the cost of storage on chain uh, is really lower compared like to other chains. And um, everything that we are building is directly on chain on ICP. So we could do it like, for example, on other chains, um, but it will be way too costly today to do it. So we are definitely open to see uh, other projects and other blockchains to be used for what we're trying to achieve, but everything should be linked to the cost of storage. So today, let's say um, you want to store one gigabyte of data, okay, for 100 years on ICP cost sixty dollars. So it's quite reasonable to do it, and you could create like an NFT with that amount of data, so one gigabyte of data, directly on chain. I'm assuming it was a stellar question from Fatty Bags um, about storage, but I couldn't hear it. But uh, good stuff. Um, yeah, I'm assuming it, it's, and good, thanks for bringing up ICP. I had a question on like the why, but you've answered that. Um, do you, do you kind of assume that most of the people holding the gold and being a part of this actually will never touch or see it? Um, I think definitely the, the idea here, and um, that's what is interesting. Let's imagine that we guys are like, I don't know where you guys are based. I imagine in probably in USA. Um, we are based in Switzerland. So we are in Europe, like we are used to gold. We can buy gold quite easily. But let's say you are in a country where it's a bit more difficult. Let's say you are in Nigeria, for example, and you want to act like to, to be able to buy gold and to trust that the gold that you are buying is real, exists, and it's somewhere safe. And what we are providing here is a solution where you can buy gold from anywhere in the world and you definitely will be able to buy a certain type of gold that is Swiss gold. And we have a partnership with Metalor, that is one of the biggest refineries of gold in the world that is based in Switzerland, that sells gold to the National Bank of Switzerland. And that makes you, that gives you the possibility to buy it, you know. And 
maybe you will never see it, but if you need to see it, and if you want to see it, you can. And everything is audited by KPMG because we wanted something that gives a little bit more of credibility and gives a lot of layer of trust that we could bring. So the gold that is stored in Switzerland is audited. So you know it's there and the audits are being done like uh, all the time. And we also had the idea of making you able to come and see the gold if you want. If you buy a large quantity of gold and if it's worth it for you to come to Switzerland to see it, you can do it. Amazing. Well, thank you for that that pitch. We are going to finish up here. I want to just really thank all of our speakers, our sponsors, Gold Dow here, uh, Vinny, and thank everyone up here. I do, I do want to do a quick wrap. Uh, I always like to do this. It's a lot of fun. Maybe, Vinny, you could kick us off. Um, you know, what, what do you see the headline? You know, if there's a headline in the community in, in crypto that you want to see, you know, we're in this raging bull market six months from now. Things are just going crazy. Um, what's the headline? that you, you want to see? Is it, you know, NFTs are back, 500 trillion market cap? Like, what, what do you think we're going to see here in six months? Well, I definitely believe that in six months, our, the scenario of NFTs will be totally changed by, by the better, by the, by the best. And what we expect is to have what we saw back in 2021. 20, 20, 20, uh, I'm not sure if the numbers will be that high. Uh, pro pro probably not, but as we, we expect that 